You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mom, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is Stephen Cotler. Well, thanks for tuning in to Author Stories today. We've got a fantastic show for you. Go to HankGarner.com and subscribe to the show. Any way that you download podcasts, you can listen to it there. I'd like to talk about some sponsors before we get started. Scribophile is a respectful online writing workshop and writer's community. Writers of all skill levels join to improve each other's work with thoughtful critiques and by sharing their writing experience. We're the writing group to join if you want to find beta readers, get the best feedback around, learn how to get published, and be part of the friendliest and most successful writing workshop online. Improve your writing by receiving detailed critiques, learn from a vast collection of free writing resources, make lifelong friends in our busy community of writers, Writing is a solitary art, but that doesn't mean you have to be lonely. Lucky for you, there are thousands of writers on Scribophile every day, and we're a really friendly bunch. You've never seen a writing group like this one. Join Scribophile today at Scribophile.com. For the Words is a unique writing motivator unlike anything I've ever seen. For the Words is an online writing platform which motivates writers of all backgrounds to increase their word count through gamification. Writing can be challenging, especially when you need to consistently produce a high output of words. By injecting a little fun into that routine and using daily rewards to promote a healthy writing habit, For the Words makes it easier to reach those word count goals. We're a community of bloggers, professional authors, college and high school students, Research scientists, gamers, and first-time writers from all over the world. Come for the words. Stay for the fun. It's ForTheWords.com. That's the number four, TheWords.com. Writers, the internet is one of the best tools for research and creativity, but it can also be one of the biggest hindrances to productivity, distracting you from doing the seat-in-chair, hand-on-keyboard work. Rescue Time gives you an accurate picture of how you spend your time to help you become more productive every day. Spot inefficiencies in your day and become better at managing your time. Create a goal, like spending less than one hour per day on email, to help you stay focused. Set an alarm to tell you when you spent more than two hours a day on Facebook. Try Rescue Time and use our special discount code for 30% off our Rescue Time premium account by going to rescuetime.com slash author stories let us help you rescue your time well thanks for joining me again for the author stories podcast where i bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers today i'm really excited to have stephen kotler on the show with me today stephen is the author of eight bestsellers including stealing fire the rise of superman tomorrowland bold abundance west of jesus a small furry prayer and the angle quickest for flight He's been translated into 40 languages, appeared in over 100 publications, including the New York Times, Atlantic Monthly, Wall Street Journal, Forbes, Wired, and Time. Both A Small Furry Prayer and Stealing Fire were nominated for the Pulitzer Prize. He also has a fantastic new novel called Last Tango in Cyberspace. Uh, And uh, I've had the book for about a month now, and it is mind-blowing. It uh, was everything I expected from a Stephen Kotler novel, which is uh, a little different from what we've expected in the past. Welcome to the show, Stephen. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to have you. Uh, We begin each show with the same question, and that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? (laughs) I wrote my first, I was four years old. My grandmother was uh my grandmother sort of like thought she was a poet and was writing like these really horrific hallmark card kind of like things and i like i remember sitting down and i was like she doesn't know what she's doing i was four and i literally wrote my first poem it was a takeoff on little boy blue is all i can tell you but i it was in a little green notebook that i had for years i was four years old so yeah i've wanted to do this my whole life 
if nothing more than to rescue grandma. Yeah, you know, everybody's <laughs> everybody's got to have a mission. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Uh, that's amazing. Um, did did you start? You said that that you realized uh, that this was just not good. Um, what what stood out to you? Um, or I guess let me ask this: um, Did you feel like you could decipher what was wrong? Could could you see the problem I, with it, and could you see that there could be better? So I don't. At four, I have no idea how to answer this question. <laughs> what I can tell you: So if there was like seminal moment in young life of writer, sophomore year in high school, I take a creative writing class. First day of class, uh, the teacher passes out E. Cummings. Buffalo Bill's defunct. And I had never seen language like that, but E. Cummings was writing exactly the way words in my brain were working. And I like I thought I was just this really strange, strange guy who thought very, very differently from normal <laughs> people. And I was like, wait a minute, I might be this really, really strange guy, but I am not alone. There are other strangers. And I knew I had a really fundamental understanding of what you could do with language and you know now in the work I do now like I understand the neurobiology underneath it and like how it works in our brain and, and, and stuff along those lines um, but I had a really I, I, I sort of had that I had a, I didn't have a ton of other things going for me but I had this really sort of innate sense of language and how to play with it I took me a really long time I sort of came in backwards I started out as a poet and then like sort of worked my way into fiction writing and then into novel writing. It took me a really long time to get any real control of my craft. And I swear to God, I did not really – I didn't learn to spell or really understand the rules of grammar till I was already in graduate school. I'm not really exaggerating. Yeah, yeah. Well, you you probably saw something else as more important than the mechanics. Um, can you, uh, yeah, I, can, I mean, can I you saw, put your finger on that? I know exactly. I mean what – you learn from Cummings is that right? anything about writing is all you're doing is producing kind of emotions and readers and like little moments of memories, right? And it's – I'll give you a really simple example of that. Um, not about your favorite five books, but if I were to ask you to tell me about your favorite you know, books five to 15 on the list, you're going to tell me essentially how that book made you feel and maybe two or three things. And maybe you remember – four more things. But like the author spent two years working on that book, putting a ton of stuff into it and you loved it. And yet your memory is going to be seven bits and mostly they're going to be emotions. So I had a really good understanding early on of how putting word X next to word Y allowed you to create certain emotions as opposed to other emotions. And I remember one of the things that early on in my journalism career, um, Art Cooper, who ran GQ, is sort of one of the last lines in new journalism and was really one of my early mentors, um, used to point out that I would do this thing. I didn't even know how I did it for a really long time, but I could go from the microscopic to the macroscopic without losing my readers in about a sentence and a half. And that's a big kind of huge emotional shift. But I had I had that ability to sort of do that. There was, again, a ton of stuff. I didn't know how to do it all, but I, I had a sense of that one. Well, you have this really interesting way uh, in your writing of, um, you know, we we talk about narrative nonfiction, and, and I'm speaking about your your nonfiction work specifically before we get into the novel. Um, but you have a way of of sucking the reader in, making us feel like we're part of this high heady stuff, uh, and making it uh, making it connect almost on a heart level, which is, which is a weird thing for a journalist who talks about high performance and, and things like that. Um, do you feel like your, your time working with poetry uh, informed the way you approach your other work? That's interesting. Um, what I think is this, uh, among many things, I think, and it sort of actually t ties a little bit to the novel, but I think one, today, if you're going to give me your attention, right, um, the, it, it, the, so many things want your attention. And if you're actually going to give one of my books six or seven hours, that's a big gift. Thank you very much. And on the other end of that, I believe I have two responsibilities. One, to really engage you, to drive you through the story, and two, to blow your mind along the way. And I learned my new novel is sort of a cyberpunk novel, a little bit inspired by William Gibson. 
And what I learned reading Gibson in the early 80s when I read Neuromancer for the first time, I went, holy crap, you can talk about the biggest ideas in the world without having to sacrifice kind of a page turning really fun plot. And at that point, I had been reading like a lot of Thomas Pynchon, a lot of John Barth, who was one of my mentors. And, you know, big idea books, David Foster Wallace, were lugubrious. They're amazing, but they're not fun reads. And I, so I sort of felt a duty to do both for my readers. I wanted to kind of drive you through the story because I want to respect your time and I want you to have a great time along the way. And I want to try to blow your minds. And I find, by the way, that if I can – the Sufis used to say stories slip right past the ego. And I think that's true. Like if I can bring you along for the ride, I can actually kind of – teach you bigger ideas. And I, you know, the teaching stuff, I always, I just don't figure I'm not that smart. And if I can learn it, anybody can learn it. So I just asked myself, well, okay, here's this really big idea that I had to learn to get paid so I could make my rent for a magazine article, right? So how did I learn it? What did I learn first? What did I learn second? What did I learn third? What did I learn fourth? And then I try to teach it to you. And I always teach people to teach people things this way for two reasons. One is, I, you know, I don't think any of us are all that smart. So if you can learn it, somebody else can learn it. And how did you learn it is a really good way to inform that. The second thing is we love to learn. I mean, as human beings, we love to learn. It produces a lot of dopamine. We get passionate and inspired. And I think what you talked about is the heart stuff is me by teaching you, like I get excited all over again to relearn the thing that I'm learning as I teach it to you. And I think that's what comes through. Yeah, the 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 passion uh, for sharing something that you have learned is definitely uh, uh, it's uh, it's infectious almost, and it really it really starts to touch on uh, something else that you talk a lot about in your in your work is empathy and the the ability to connect with someone else uh, on a deep level and, and communicating teaching is, is almost getting into that area, isn't it? Yeah, and. Um, I, you know, I was fortunate or unfortunate or, or whatever to grow up as kind of a weirdo in Cleveland, Ohio at a time that there weren't a whole lot of weirdos in Cleveland, Ohio. So if you were a punk or a communist or comic book artist or a filmmaker or a musician or a magician or a take your pick, you sort of congregated on like one street. And so I got to meet all kinds of walks of life and it was, you know, and I got to see how, and this, again, showed up in my journalism and as a bartender, by the way, paying my way through grad school and, 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 and starting out as a writer. Um, I, I met – like I knew people who were the sweetest, kindest, nicest teddy bears who kept me alive and saved my life. And they also were enforcers for motorcycle gangs and killed people for a living. I knew people in and out of jail who were amazing artists. And like so I saw both sides of everything from a very early age. Um, and it really, you know, I really wide empathy. I, I think I bring that in and a deep curiosity because, I, you know, you can find genius almost anywhere. I, I, I really I, al I often say I don't really think there are that many dumb people in the world, but there are a lot of people who speak a lot of different languages. And if you can learn somebody's language, they can usually sort of dazzle you with at least one thing that they've learned along the way. Oh, that's that's amazing. Uh, what were what were some of the first topics that that got your uh, imagination going uh, that you started to write about and and, and realize that uh, or kind of what set your path on the kind of work that you've been doing? Well, I, I mean the story I always tell is uh, you know I came in I mean novel writing I, like I swear to. <laughs> I, I, I wanted to be the next Thomas Pynchon. I didn't want to be the guy who is known to be like the great communicator. I'm the guy who could explain the hardest things in the world to anyone. And honestly, like it was a superpower that I could have cared less about. I wanted to be this big genius who did David Foster all this stuff with words and, you know, what I mean kind of thing. It was all about ego. And I realized like as a journalist, holy crap, I have to make a living doing this stuff. And this communication thing is what I'm – so I, I sort of like that – um, that was what set me on my path. But what really caught fire underneath me is I started out covering action sports in the early 1990s. And I started seeing these action sport athletes literally 
do the impossible, right? Like do things over and over again that people thought had could not be done, would never be done, thought were beyond the bounds of biology and the laws of physics. And like it was happening all the time. And it got me obsessed with this question of what does it take to do the impossible? And I think really in almost all of my books, with the possible exception of the new novel, that question has been the central question. And I don't mean it in terms of hyperbole. I mean it in terms of like actual practicality. When you see a paradigm shift you know, breakthrough in technology. For example, my book Tomorrowland is about, I think it's 18 different stories of 18 different maverick inventors who took a science fiction idea and turned it into science fact technology. We literally like did the impossible dreaming up the future, right? So I've looked at this in sports, in technology, in business, in culture, in, you know, going up against kind of grand global challenges, environmental problems, sort of everywhere. And that's like, what does it take to the impossible has really been my central driving theme, I think. Well, the, talking about the action sports uh, in the 90s, I remember um, being a, a skater punk kid, you know, in the early 80s when uh, when I was becoming a teenager. God and, bless. Yeah, you know, and that was, you know, the people involved in, in that type of stuff uh, are, are really kind of carrying forth the punk aesthetic. Um you know that the you know I'm going to do what what people say I can't do things that that shouldn't be possible and I'm going to do them in places where people put up fences to keep me out. Um, I you know, yeah and, I, I I like I it's so great that you bring it up because I you know so many people credit like the '60s right. as inventing technology and Silicon Valley and oh this was you know the Grateful Dead used to play the Warlocks and they played at Silicon Valley tech part and yeah well that's kind of true but the punks the entire DIY movement that has become the yes. entrepreneurial movement that came out of punk the entire by the way the whole social justice movement right that we're seeing now a lot of that was very very punk in that it was if you go earlier there was a lot of social justice but it was a big deal with the punks, we were just like, you know what? We don't care what color you are. We don't care what religion you are. We like, we like, we really don't care. Everybody, everybody gets to be equal as far as as we're concerned, because you know, as far as every, we're concerned, everybody was sort of screwed together. Right. <laughs> right. What did What did Morrissey say? The bomb, the bomb, the bomb will bring us together. Right. <laughs> well, the the same kind of attitude uh, now is bleeding into technology and into. Um, the, the same kind of thing of pushing boundaries and doing the thing that, that we're not supposed to do and, and pushing ourselves, um, it, that, that same kind of punk aesthetic is that's so bringing I, I, us into the present and future. This is a big theme in last hang on cyberspace. Yes. And, right. I talk about the importance of what I call countercultural evolution, which is to say, innovation is what drives culture forward, right? It drives, it drives growth in the economy. It drives everything um, across the boards and innovation doesn't happen in the mainstream. If the mainstream is too stable, it's built for safety and security. You can't innovate in the mainstream. The mainstream has no immune system. It's going to react against you and try to stomp you out. So innovation always takes places on the fringes and in nature, right? Like in evolution, we call this niche creation in businesses. You want to innovate in a big company, you create a skunk works an offsite you know, little hideout where you can do your innovation away from the immune system of the company. In culture, it's counterculture. So if you want to know where is culture going, you watch counterculture. And so one of the things, just to take this one step further, this is really in Last Tango. I talk about poly tribes. Poly tribes are blending together of cultures. And we're seeing this. The internet made subculture visible. And once that happened, subculture started blending in really unique, weird ways. And I'll give you a crazy real world example that's in Last Tango. I was in southern Chile, very conservative southern Chile, Cayaque, right on top of Patagonia, the you know, ice sheets start down there. It's a very small Catholic community, cute town. And they birthed a subculture back in the early thousands that was called the Pokemon subculture. And these were teenagers who had borrowed West Coast hip hop clothing, East Coast emo style haircuts, Japanese Gairu makeup, like California bisexuality, um, Brit punk sneer and they rebelled i kid you not by wet kissing strangers on a street so they <laughs> run up to like old men and women and i'll tell you the crazy part is it so freaked out the government in chile that they used white supremacist gangs to stomp them out 
and literally it was the first time I've ever seen a, 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 I kid you not the subculture was there freaked people out and it was gone you can still look it up on the internet the Pokemon culture but like it was one of the first times I've ever seen anything like that happen I mean which is not to say like our own government tried damn hard to step up stamp up the Black Panthers and right a whole lot of that stuff went on but they didn't succeed this was like it they're gone that's uh that's a scary thought right. um, you, you know that uh wow wow um did what uh what was your history with um with computer culture i i know if if you read last tango um william gibson is uh was definitely an influence and you even take gibson kind of to the next level it's it's not just that gibson was an influence it's like what what if gibson was right and and what if uh you know how does this actually play out um do, were you part of the early computer culture yeah so i had the like sort of incredible good fortune to move to san francisco in 1987 for the first time and i helped work on kind of one of the very first uh um it was going to be a computer game that used it biofeedback to help the players navigate the game. And this was in the early 1990s. I helped, uh, I worked on one of the first online magazines. I was, uh, I did a lot of writing for Wired and, and things like that. So I wasn't first generation, of course, or, in se- or second generation, but I was, I was there and I saw a lot of this sort of emerge. And I've, you know, I've covered technology as a journalist, as an author in three different books now, and now in kind of novel form and last time on cyberspace for a long time as well. So I'm sort of fascinated um, by technology. It shows up everywhere in the work I do. Yeah. Well, the um, a, a lot of your previous work um, and that you're that you still do, but a lot of your previous books have dealt with human performance, and um, which you you would think is is uh, is a separate thing from the um uh, the near future techno thriller of your new book um but the new book actually kind of brings those things uh together what what was the thing that first got you interested in human performance and and biohacking if you will so um when i was 30 years old i first of all i was watching these athletes do the impossible when i was 30 years old i got lyme disease and i spent 3 years in bed and i ended up inadvertently curing myself Use, this is going to sound really crazy out loud, but using surfing. And when I was going surfing, I was producing these really profound altered states of consciousness. And I found myself after three years in bed, after not being able to walk across a room, after like being functional 10% of the time, after bankrupting myself, trying to find cures, after losing the job I spent a decade getting and the woman I was going to marry and all the crap, um, I'm suddenly getting better because like I've been dragged to the ocean, I'm surfing and I'm having these altered states of consciousness of what the hell is going on. And Lyme is only fatal if it gets in your brain. And could this only be a mirage and am I actually dying? That sort of lit a fire under myself. And what I discovered is the reason I was healing through surfing is surfing was producing an altered state of consciousness known as flow. And flow has a couple of very powerful healing properties. It sort of resets the nervous system. And I had an autoimmune condition, which is a nervous system gone haywire. So that the, that was doing that. And the neurochemicals that underpin the state sort of boost um, – your immune system. But the same state of consciousness that helped me get from seriously subpar back to normal was helping normal people go all the way up to Superman, right? And this is what I was seeing in action sports. And pretty much anywhere you see the impossible become possible, you see a state of consciousness known as flow, right? It's it's our optimal state of performance. It's how we're hardwired evolutionarily to perform at our best. So I got super fascinated with that. That does not, by the way, it's I tend, I tell people I always work at the intersection of human capability and disruptive technology because technology has, you know, I, I run the flow research collective and we have one of the largest flow labs in the world. And we use artificial intelligence and big data and all kinds of cutting edge neuroscience, fMRI, you know, to EEG, et cetera, et cetera, to help decode these states of human performance. So they're coming together more and more and and where they really come together and this is what sort of last tango really talks about is the skills 
we need to thrive in the 21st century. If you talk to any expert, they're going to list, give you a list that is along the lines of creativity and innovation, collaboration, communication, cooperation, and the list goes on and on. And we, if, if you look at the literature, we have a very hard time training up these skills. And the reason is we keep trying to train up sets of skills. What we need to be training up is states of consciousness, states of consciousness, shifting consciousness is how evolution shaped the brain to do those things, right? When you to amplify cooperation, you want to expand empathy. That's a state of consciousness. That's not a skill set exactly. So that's sort of all this stuff. It all sort of, and it all gets to, you know, weave together a little bit more in Last yeah. Tango. Well, I I would imagine that when you start talking about um, altered states of consciousness, that a certain percentage of your audience is just like, uh, okay, this not not for me. I I don't quite understand that and he's talking about well woo -woo. Uh, yeah i'm not talking about woo, -woo. It's, I, yes. I i work on neurobiology right right, right. Um, but as as you know a large part of our audience are writers uh and and readers um i think we all have been in the place when when you're writing and the story just takes over and you know the your fingers are flying across the keyboard nothing else in the world matters but you're engaged in the story and you look up in an hour two hours have gone by and then you read back over it and you're like, this, this can't be me. This is, this is way more profound than, than is in me. And, and we've been in that state that you're talking about. Um, what is it about that state that allows creativity to come out? And uh, because I think we've all been in that. Place yeah. Before. So that's a great question. And so we have at the flow research collective, we have a uh, partnership with, uh, the in USC's Institute for Neuroscience and Performance, uh, Michael Gervais' lab there, and we're doing a, a, a big study on flow and creativity, building on work that was done at Harvard, the University of Sydney. So I'm, I'm, I won't go too technical, but creativity is a lot of things, but it's essentially the brain taking in novel information and finding ways to connect it to older ideas uh, to produce something that's startlingly new, right? Like that's the experience of that. That's what happens in flow where you're writing stuff and you don't know where it's coming from. Your brain's making connections that you didn't even know it could make. So underneath those connections is a neural chemical known as dopamine. You probably have heard about dopamine as a pleasure chemical, right? And it's everywhere. People talk about it as a pleasure drug and it is, but it also does something else. It tunes signal to noise ratios. A fancy way of saying when we have more dopamine in our system, we notice faster and more connections between ideas. So flow is a huge dopamine spike, a bunch of other things. So in studies we've done, University of Sydney and Australia has done, Harvard has done, you can see creativity spike up to 400% in flow. Um, and that's an enormous, enormous, enormous spike in creativity. To put it in a totally different context, at the University of Sydney, they put, uh, they, they gave people the nine dot problem, connect these nine dots uh, with four lines uh, without lifting your pencil from a page, uh, you know, in under 10 minutes or less, you've seen it. And it's a very hard creative problem solving puzzle that less than 5% of the population can actually solve. Um, it requires a huge step in lateral thinking. You have to be able to think outside the box. You have to be able to do these cool things, the same kind of connections you have to make to write really, really well in used by inducing an artificial flow state. Um, while less than 5% of the population can solve this problem normally, they got 46% of a study group who solved it in record time. So these states of consciousness are massively boosting flow. At the Flow Research Collective, we work with everybody from the top executives to Google to the U.S. Special Forces. We've trained up tens of thousands of individuals. Um, Morgan Stanley, the list of businesses go on and on and on. This is, you know, you may say that sounds woo and weird. This is mainstream high performance going wide in business today. That is amazing. Um, it, I think we, like we said earlier, a lot of us have been in that place before. And, but when you look back, I, I think a lot of us have trouble putting our finger on exactly what happened. How did we get there? Um, is this something that can be? Yeah, so and and can and I, can be brought it, on. And I, so I like I this is this is out of school, and I apologize for what I'm going to do. But it's the actual answer to your question. I run twice a year a two day boot camp called Flow for Writers. 
that is literally a deep dive into here's how flow works. Here's how we get more of it. Here's how we use the state to amplify creativity. Here's how we use it to amplify writing. I, by the way, it's also there. If you're a reader, if you're, if you're reading a book that you can't stop reading and you're turning the page after page, that's a flow state, right? So like the neuroscience of flow underpins the neuroscience of reader engagement. So understanding how this works in the brain is the secret to writing books that people can't put down. <laughs> well, yeah, that, that's what I was going to say is that, that this not only would be um, uh, a, a great thing for writers who want to get there, but if you could write a book that would uh, engage someone in the flow state, then right, so let everybody me, let, wins. Let, let, me, let, me, let me do this for you. All right. Remember we talked earlier about dopamine? Yeah. All right. So um, I wish I could come up with a clean joke. Uh, I can't come up with a clean joke. So I get, all right. Go, go so right ahead. Here's a, here's, here's a weird tech joke for you, and then we'll go okay. from there. So, right. um, and the bartender says, we don't serve time travelers in here. A time traveler walks into a bar. <laughs> okay. So you felt that feeling when your brain went, oh crap, this is reversed. And you got that little rush of surprise. And that was dopamine. Okay. And I just put dopamine into your system by telling you a joke, but because dopamine amplifies pattern recognition and enjoyment and motivation, you are now much more engaged in the text and you can actually see deeper patterns. So I can now teach you something more complicated than I could a moment ago. And I've got more of your attention marshaled on my text than I did a moment ago, simply by creating surprise because it produces dopamine and that produces reader engagement. So that stuff is very, very teachable and very learnable and repeatable. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's on both sides. It accelerates. You can really learn to use this stuff to accelerate kind of your writing process. Um, I'm, I've become very prolific and my books seem to do pretty well. So I think I'm doing a good job with them. I'm using all this stuff to drive my books forward. Anybody can do it. A lot of times when we hear uh, about dopamine, it, it's a lot of times presented in a in a negative light um, when we're talking about things like social media or eating things like sugar, oh. um, that these are, these are hitting dopamine receptors and, and we're getting these, these false highs all the time. Um, but, but you talk about dopamine in a positive light. How do we separate those two and how do we know? So it's a, um, yeah, it's a great question. And here's the, here's the unfortunate truth of, 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 of neurobiology, which is we've got, over 50 different neurochemicals in our brain and they all do a ton of different stuff, right? All they, re all any neurochemical does is it's a communication. It's a signaling molecule. It says do more of this or do less of this, but the more and the less that these chemicals do, it's all over the place. So dopamine is the most addictive drug on earth is cocaine. All that happens when people snort cocaine is it forces the brain to release like five, six hundred percent of its dopamine into the bloodstream at once and into kind of our neuroreceptacles and it blocks its reuptake. So there's no difference. This is addictive neurochemistry. Dopamine shows up whenever we're about to take a risk. So it underpins courage. Um, dopamine shows up with pattern recognition and underpins motivation, but you are right. It's also sex addiction. It is drug addiction. It is gambling addiction. It is shopping addiction. For example, at the flow research collective, right? Where we are teaching people how to alter their consciousness. First thing I tell you people is don't ever go shopping in a flow state. It's a freaking disaster. Your pattern recognition <laughs> system is through there. You're going to spend money on stuff that you don't really want. And this is not just, I mean, you're laughing, but it's an ethical problem. There are a lot of marketers. There are a lot of self-help gurus who will get on stage, use all kinds of techniques, mostly cultic, to alter your state of consciousness. And then they will try to sell you the next level of their training. Well, they've just put you in a state of consciousness where everything looks good. Pattern recognition is all turned up. You've feel, got feel-good neurochemistry. And here's the bumper is to boot your prefrontal cortex, the part of your brain that does long-term decision-making. It's turned down. So you can no longer see into the future. So you're spending money that you don't even have on stuff you don't even want because they tilted your consciousness. So very, very, very tricky, but also secret to human performance. It's the same chemistry. It's one of the dirty little secrets of what we're now learning about the human body, which is we are programmed by addiction. What people call habits are literally 
just addictions. So a lot of what we think about as I talk about, one of the secrets to high performance is getting your biology to work for you and not against you. Um, William James used to say, you got to be your nervous system, your ally and not your enemy. It's the same sort of thing. But like, you know, we, we are driven by addictive neurochemistry. So addiction management is a lot of uh, what goes on in some of the peak performance stuff. And there's literally no way around it. Well, this, this perfect storm of technology and um, understanding uh, brain chemistry and our, our neurochemistry is uh, is really the setup for the new book Last Tango in Cyberspace. Um it's it's set in the very near future, just a few years out ahead of us now. Uh and you're taking a lot of the uh the science fact from today and and just kind of letting it run to its natural course over the next few years. Uh what was the what was the idea to make this a novel instead of just another uh kind of narrative nonfiction taking us through what might be what why why couch this in fiction one like the uh, for, for me uh i like i i i like to read nonfiction, but i always try to read if i'm going to read two nonfiction books the third book i read is the next book i read is a novel and i do that because novels are, give us perspective right like that's they widen out your perspective and often right i'm reading richard powers the overstory right now so i'm literally like living in a world from the perspective of trees Oh my God. And it's amazing, right? Like it's an astounding book. And I am like, I'm in a world where I'm seeing not even just the perspective of trees, but like of redwoods that have been alive since like the birth of Christ. It's a, it's a weird way to look at the world. So what I, but to answer your question is it is very difficult in nonfiction. I can tell you this tech is coming and this is its developmental curve. And this is how we're seeing it. And this tech is coming and this tech is coming, but they're overlapping, they're converging and they're altering the kind of the fundamental fabric of reality in ways that it's really hard to communicate in nonfiction, but I can put a reader into the world in fiction and suddenly because it's a world, you can just hold the whole thing in your head and you're like, holy crap, this is where we're going to be in five years. And yeah, the, I mean, every technology in that book, with the exception of kind of one, uh, is in a lab somewhere or already in the world. Nothing, there's nothing, nothing's made up. Um, it's amazing. I mean, even the weird stuff, like there's an AI that stores information in diamonds in the book. That's real. We know how to store information and build computers out of diamonds. That's real. There's a face reading there's an aquarium that they use at TSA where one of the characters passes through the aquarium as his way to kind of enter the country. And the reason they do that is they're using AI driven face reading technology. You can sort of defeat it if you know it's coming, but by walking through an aquarium, the fish and the natural world like habitat distracts you enough that you can't disguise your facial expressions. So the face reading technology can read your face and determine if you're a terrorist like this, oh, like wow. this is real. It's coming. They've got it now. It's in the Middle East now. It's coming to America. Whoa. Well, you know, there's technology is uh, uh, is kind of crazy in that that dopamine creating um, aspect that we talked about earlier. And um, you know, you you think uh, when you look at something in in the the future, and uh, you're you're like, well, that it could never get to that point yet. We have people walking around with um, with with cell phones and with apps that uh, let me let me, let me this isn't in last tango, but this is my response yeah. to that. Okay? Okay. This is the one that this is the one that you, I you know like, where I'm going. Yeah. And I'm trying to this is the one I have trouble wrapping my head around. So pretty much everybody understands that over the next three to five years, autonomous cars are going to replace self-driving cars are going to replace regular cars. And we know this shift is coming. Uber is moving to an autonomous fleet. All the major car companies have autonomous cars. And the rollout dates for fleets are 1919, 2020. And oh my God, what a crazy level of disruption. Okay, fine. Fair enough. Uber, I was at the second annual flying car conference by Uber was hosting earlier this year. Flying cars, flying Uber taxis are debuting in Los Angeles and Dallas in 2023. Like they're, the cars are here, half a dozen different manufacturers, all the major aerospace men, like we have flying cars and we're about to have flying Ubers by 2023. 
That's a, I mean, I'm a Blade Runner fan. I, you know, I remember the Blade Runner. We have been dreaming of flying cars. Literally, the first mention of them is like these flying chariots that show up this Hindu text in 8,000 BC. Like this is an 8,000 year old fantasy <laughs> right. that is right. suddenly, bam, it's here. And like that, I, you know, that's the one that blew. That's a lot of them are mind blowing to me. That's the one that I look at and just like, wow, flying cars. Okay. Well, and even as fascinating as that technology is and the things that, that, like you said, we've been wanting for 8,000 years and, uh, you know, we all want a a better, faster, smarter computer and and all of these things. These things are are incremental things that we can imagine. Um, But the, the real frontier is when we start changing our bodies and our minds and our consciousness. Yep. Is, is that the great next frontier? So that's an interesting question. And I would say, so there are three, yes, is my answer. And there are, I think, <laughs> three prongs to that frontier. And I'll give you the prongs. How they start to intermesh and overlap, that's a totally different discussion. Prong one is kind of the work that we're doing at the Flow Research Collective and a lot of other people are starting to spearhead into how do we shift consciousness um, to increase performance, to alter states. And there's the, you know, there's the psychedelic arm of this. There's a meditative arm. There's the work we're doing on flow. There's a lot of stuff going on here. So that's, that's one. The second realm is in virtual reality, which is a whole other kind of, we're going to be migrating from the actual into the virtual. We're going to start checking into the matrix and not coming back, I think. Um, and that's going to be a major consciousness shift. And simultaneously brain computer interfaces are, Moving fast. I think like some of the predictions we're hearing, Brian Johnson, Elon Musk, and these are, these are men I respect. No, but uh, I think I don't, I don't think they understand all their neuroscience. And I think their timetables are a little hyped up for, you know, when brain computer interfaces start coming. But we're talking about using computers to create hive minds. Borgs, you know, you, you you're in a Navy SEAL group, and now instead of having comms, you are networked telepathically, and that sounds unbelievably crazy. But the text and the rudiments of that tech, it's already in, a, in the lab. It, like this is real world stuff that is just on a developmental curve. It's a technological problem. It's no longer a science fiction to science fact problem. Uh, is uh, um, is augmented reality or virtual reality? Do you think the uh, what do you think is the the thing that will happen? Are, are we going to be living in? completely made up worlds or so here's aug- I think there's, two, I think there's two answers I think well I think there's three answers one is what AR what augmented reality is going to give us is a information layer that exists between ourselves and the real world so you're going to put on a pair of augmented reality glasses that look just like your Ray-Ban sunglasses you're going to walk down a street in New York And you're going to look at a building and a pop-up screen is going to emerge and it's going to show you scenes of this building was built here and this is what life looked like back then and blah, blah, blah. We're going to add an entire information layer to the planet if you want it. That, I think, uh, and that, by the way, is exploding. This is next five years. That's coming. Virtual reality, I think, is a little farther out but much more interesting. And I agree very much with the thesis in Ready Player One that app that – Education is the killer app for virtual reality, and the quick and dirty is what we know about flow is that flow is a high learning state, and simple reason is the more neurochemicals that show up during the experience, better chance that we have of moving it to long-term holding. Neurochemicals tag experiences is important, save for later. You get a bunch of neurochemicals at once that experience gets cemented in. So soldiers in flow can learn, for example, target acquisition skills 230% faster than normal. This study is run by the Department of Defense and friends of mine in a company called Advanced Brain Monitoring. Um, so that w- there's, there's that kind of stuff coming. We can use t- – we know video games put people in the flow. Virtual reality is much better at it. So what this means is in virtual reality, we can create fully distributed, right? We don't have to build classrooms anymore, um, accelerated learning environments. And with AI – uh, we can add in a individually customized level layer. So like you're a kid wherever in the world, Mumbai or in Memphis, and you're too poor to go to school. Well, suddenly all you need is a headset because you've got a distributed school. And to boot, like your learning curriculum is customized to you as an individual. And it's an accelerated learning environment because we can put you in flow 
very easily in the space. So I think that is going to be the killer app that sort of spreads virtual reality wide. What this, what you have to understand though is, Flow is five of the most potent neural chemicals the brain can cocktail. It's considered the most addictive state on earth. And it's also the most meaningful state on earth. So one of the things we know from positive psychology is flow directly correlates to meaning, overall life satisfaction, well-being. And there are reasons for this. But what this basically means is we can create completely addictive, completely meaningful states of consciousness inside of VR. It means that VR is going to be very soon more fun and more meaningful than regular reality. If that development happens to coincide with the kind of five years where AI and robot really start to take jobs and we have a lot of unemployed people who are turning to video games or virtual reality to pass the time and suddenly VR is more fun than regular reality, that's interesting. If we can then use that environment to retrain those workers into new jobs faster than ever before, that's interesting. These are kind of killer app functions that everybody's going to need. So I think the timetable is a, later, a little later into VR than AR, but like I don't think anything I'm talking about is beyond 5, 10, 15 years. And I will tell you on the flow education stuff that it, we're directly working on that at the flow research collective. That is absolutely one thing we're doing. How does this idea of flow, uh, that you're so passionate about, how does it play into last tango in cyberspace? Last tango looks at, uh, so the lead character lion Zorn, right. Uh, uh, has a unique ability to feel empathy, uh, that's wider and deeper than most people. And uh, this allows him, you know, it, it, to drive the book forward. He, he actually can, doesn't just feel empathy for individuals, but he can extend it into plants, animals, ecosystems, AIs, robots, and even culture. So he has a wide form of empathy, not just individuals. And he can use it as a kind of, that's sort of like cool hunting 2.0. He can track cultural trends into the future. It's a useful skill to a certain kind of company. And he, you know, one of these companies hires him and he gets embroiled in what starts out as a murder mystery and grows into kind of a global thriller conspiracy. That said, empathy is sort of the secret weapon, right? The reason the book focuses so much on expanding empathy is we absolutely, if we need more cooperation, more collaboration, more communication to survive, we need more empathy. It's sort of the, it, it's the magic weapon. It automatically widens perspective and, and it does, you know, it's our biology working for us rather than against us. And one of the things we know, and this is work that came out of Harvard over the past 50 years is that the more flow you get, and it's actually, it, it may actually be the more altered states of consciousness, but for sure, the more flow you get, the higher you move up, what's known as the adult development curve, which really means you gain wisdom, perspective, and empathy. So flow seems to expand empathy. doesn't happen automatically. You still have to do some personal growth work along the way, but it does, it does tend to drive in that direction. So there, it directly correlates that way, and I wanted to play that out a few years into the future. AI has uh, grown from a buzzword to something that that people are seriously uh, concerned about it, it, in a in a fearful way and in uh, uh, in a it, kind of uh, in a uh, thing thing that people are excited about. Um, how do you see that technology growing, and what do you think it means for writers and people that uh, that are working in the empathy space? Well, okay, so those are radically those are those are sort of different questions, and I'm going to come at them from a couple of different angles, and I hopefully I'll answer them along the way. Um, for writing, like let's just like let's not kid ourselves. There's a company called Narrative Science that is using AI to write sports stories, business stories, environmental stories. If you read business straight up business news in Forbes, or you read sport baseball scores and a lot of major newspapers, you're reading AI generated content. And AI in 2000, I want to say 17 and maybe 18 wrote a novel and entered it into Japan's National Book Award contest and made it to the last round of judging. We've got AI created movies that are uh, you can see them on the internet and they're not they're not quite the way humans would make movies. They're spooky and weird and a little interesting. So like that like this stuff is real, don't kid yourself. But here's the cool stuff and this is what I'm interested in. All the everybody you hear all this stuff about AI is coming for our jobs, and I can speak to that directly if you'd like. But more interestingly, what the research is really showing is that the coolest collaborations are AI and human together, and what that unlocks is whole new levels of kind of creativity 
and innovation. So, and let's not kid ourselves. I was a writer before Google and the internet and after Google and the internet. I could not do the stuff I do without, you know, my AI that sort of sits on my computer, right? It sits on my computer. I call it Google now, but right. oh my God, like there are, for example, um, some, some people on my team wanted to count fa fact density per sentence. We were having conversations about writing and, and how many <laughs> facts can you put in a sentence. And one of, the, one of the things I learned at Wired Magazine is if you strip out jargon, if you write in very plain English, um, you can get three or four facts into a sentence. Um, and when I was writing Stealing Fire, sort of my last nonfiction book, I, I often said to my writing partner at the time, Jamie Wheel, we got to get Steven Pinker on this. And what I meant was Pinker, great, getting like – five or six facts into a sentence and not losing a reader. And the topic in Stealing Fire was so dense, I had to pack more facts into a sentence than I was used to. Um, and so getting access to all those facts to do that in an era before Google, like I remember what that was like. Um, and, you know, vicious. I remember doing an FBI story where I like flew around the country going from police district to police district, collecting police reports. I was in like 47 cities in like 30 days, right? Just tried to track down police reports for like a story, by the way, that ended up getting killed, that never even ran. I spent oh six, six months on it. It was one of those impossible stories. I tried to do it for New York Magazine. I failed. Ten years later, the New Yorker actually did it, but they, write, they didn't nail the story. It was just – it was a weird tale. It was this con artist who was running around the world, conning people out of millions of dollars. And every place he went, every time he ripped off people's money, he'd get arrested. And then the FBI would swoop in and get him out of jail over and over and over again. <laughs> and nobody, nobody, nobody. And, and all the paperwork would vanish, which was what I was, I was going from police department to police department going, wow, where the hell is the paperwork? It's got, they were like, yeah, they took it. The feds took it. And I was like, oh my God, oh, what is this guy? Who is this guy? I never got the story. Um, the New Yorker, I don't think, uh, did either, but it was, a, it was a wild ride, but that was like, you know, this is the era pre-internet. Now you could just do a web search and have like all your police records. You're, you know, pretty much done. Um, so it's a, you know, it's a big deal. And I, so I, you know, yeah, it's scary. It's going to mean a lot of change in a short period of time. And that's always hard. And it's hard enough here on planet earth that like adding this in. Okay. I get it. That said, as a creative, I'm kind of psyched about what this is going to mean. Yeah, and, and I think that's the attitude we have to take is that um, uh, there's there's not going to be a replacement for us plus AI, um, or AI is not going to replace us plus AI. AI. Um, and I think I've, we have to. I, I let's not kid ourselves. I've gone bankrupt essentially twice along the way because my industry went away twice, right? Uh, the dot-com crash killed the publishing industry. I was on staff at GQ with along 43 other writers before it happened. Afterwards, there were like four writers left on staff and everybody in the world took like a 300% pay cut overnight. And it happened again in 2007, right? Like, it's like, I'm, like, I'm gonna keep writing no matter what, you can't kill me. So like, you got AI, bring it, whatever. <laughs> like. <laughs> I'm not done. You know, I like I, I people come up to me every now and again and, and, I'm, and I'm sort of always flattered and always taken back and, and say things like, oh, my God, your book saved my life or changed my life. And I, I'm always the first to point out that, like, you did that. I didn't I like I wrote the book to save my life. Um, the fact that, you know, that happened to you, that was that was about you. If it wasn't my book. It was going to be somebody else's. And you should take the credit for that. And remember, I wrote it to save my life. Right. That's fantastic. Well, the new book is Last Tango in Cyberspace. It is uh, out available everywhere uh, that you buy books. Uh, Stephen, this has been so much fun talking. I, we could just go on all day, but I know you have places to, to be. Um, if people are just learning about you and all of the fantastic work that you do, uh, where can they find you to uh, read up about it, dig into your back catalog, and follow along with what's coming up next? So easiest way to do it is go to stephencotler.com, S-T-E-V-E-N-K-O-T-L-E-R.com. You can sign up for my email newsletter, which is a hell of a lot of fun. Um, and, uh, or you can, you know, if you, the video page has so much stuff. I've got a section on my website called the rabbit hole. So you want to, everything you want to know about flow science, here's 10 articles, videos, whatever. Everything you want to know about future tech, here's what, it, you know, just sort of take your pick. Um, it's all there. It's a lot of fun. Um, it'll cost you an afternoon for sure. 
Awesome. Uh, and when is your next Flow for Writers conference coming up? I want to link to that in the show notes. The, uh, the next Flow, uh, I can get you. Uh, I can get you a hard link for it. Uh, it's it, okay. It's the second weekend in July. It's in Los Angeles. Um, Excellent. And it's really fun. Okay, we'll be sure to put a link in there to that. I know there are lots of folks that uh, that uh, probably want to take advantage of that. Uh, Stephen, this has been so much fun. Thank you so much for taking time to come on the show. Hank, thanks for having me. It was a pleasure. Thanks for listening to the Author Stories Podcast. For more great author interviews like this one, go to hankgarner.com and dig through the archives. There's something there I know you'll love. Now stay tuned for a special audio clip from Richard Gleaves' The Jason Crane Series. Seven men ran the farce. The seven witch hunters. The court of Oyer and Terminer. They tortured and lied and mutilated and murdered. They knew those women up in Salem Village were no witches. Their true target was the coven hidden in their own midst here in Salem Town. They meant to hang the innocent until the sisters surrendered. Did they surrender? said Jason. No. Was that the wrong decision? To let innocent women die and save themselves? What do you think? Should the coven have fought openly? Created more hysteria by swooping in on broomsticks and casting spells over Salem? Should they have killed the judges? There are no right decisions. That is the horror of a witch hunt. Everything you do condemns you. Question the judge, thou art a defiant witch. Question his laws, you question the king, and thou art a treasonous witch. Question his superstitions, you question scripture, and thou art a blasphemous witch. Pity the condemned, you pity witches, and thy Christian mercy proves thy collusion with Satan. Witch hunters are not just bad lawyers practicing bad law. They are men who place the ends before the means. They choose their victim, a man, a woman, an entire race, and mark them for extinction. All evidence is damning evidence. All associations are damning associations. All infractions. And who among us is without sin? Are unforgivable infractions. Their own failings and abuses of power are shrugged away as mere vigor in pursuit of the public good. A witch hunter will have you by whatever means necessary. If he cannot find evidence, he will create evidence. He will entrap you and question you and distort what you say. He will walk you through the night until your feet bleed, strip you and stripe you, dress you in your own filth until you forget you are human. He will torture your friends until they betray you. And if anyone dares to weep at your hanging, he will drag them to Gallows Hill in the back of the next ox cart. Any man can be a witch hunter. All it takes is hatred and arrogance and the preening self-regard that proclaims my deeds are always good because they are my deeds. The seven judges of the Salem court were such men. But one witch stood up to them. She stood up to centuries of unchallenged murderous dogma and pronounced the magic word, no. They burned her for it. 